Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio online lunchtime talk. These talks are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room TVs. And soon they'll be live again from the building, but more on that in the coming weeks. I'm Luke, I'm the Pervasive Media Studio producer, I'm a white man with a large ginger beard and a small mohawk, and I'm wearing a black and white t-shirt and sat in front of a bookcase and some plants. These lunchtime talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. A really big welcome to anyone out there who's new to what we do. Here's a little bit more for you. The studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology with everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between the Watershed, the University of West of England and the University of Bristol. And we're a home for early stage ideas, new companies, and a meeting place for both the creative and commercial industries. We offer a studio space, desk space, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities all for free to our residents. And ultimately, we're a safe place for people to take risks at early stages in their practice and make time for collaboration. For this week's talk, we are joined by studio resident Lucas Robbins, who is a Bristol-based award-winning creative producer and socially engaged artist. Lucas is all about connection, finding new ways for us to feel empowered to share our narratives. Lucas's design work uses devised theatre techniques, digital technology, and the dramaturgies of people to put pe of place to put people at the centre, allowing for multiple levels of engagement. Um, there'll be a Q&A at the end of the talk, as there is every week, uh, with this talk running at roughly 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions at any time, drop them into the chat window and I'll pick them up as we go. Or if you like, you can tweet us at, at PNCDO UK to ask questions there. Please feel free to share this link on any of your socials now. We are live um, and a captioned ver and recorded version of this talk will be available after the talk is finished. Before we start, next week's talk is all about the remote control residency, which is run by the company behind Mimu Gloves. Mimu Gloves are a wearable motion based musical instrument and controller. And we'll be hearing from artists about their experience of working with Mimu Gloves and how their projects have been developing. And one more thing, quick shout out that this weekend, a very special, a very special chance to uh, take part in something by the award winning composer and studio resident Duncan Speakman, who is putting on something called Only Expansion. It's a one of a kind augmented audio walk through Bristol and a walk that beautifully combines sound of your surroundings with the recordings of environments from across the globe. It's running from the workshop in Studio 5, which is just below this studio here on Saturday and Sunday between 2 and 7 p.m. You can book through the Watershed website, although some of the slots are showing as sold out, but there are lots of walk-up slots available, so do rock up and say hello. There's also the opportunity to check out work by Katie Connor and Kathy Hines, who are showing film and installation work in the Watershed as well, alongside Duncan's piece, including some really cool stuff with hydroponics. Um, you can get news on all our future talks, events, and everything else by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, following us on at PM Studio. UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget while you're sat there listening to me chat, hit subscribe on this YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up. The more likes we get, the more subscribers we get, the more we can tell stories like the one you're about to hear. For now, I'm going to hand over to Lucas. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along today. Um, so I'm a, I'm a white male. I've got a dark beard, I'm wearing glasses, um, I've got a green cord shirt on and I'm sat in a little room with some illustrations on the wall and uh, a plant behind me. Um, so in this talk, Unearth and Imagination, um, I'm going to talk through some of my findings, research and future ideas that I've been exploring during the last sort of year. Um, over the last year, um, my focus and my interest have been on unearthing soil narratives and our relationship to soil in the UK in the face of the environmental crisis. Um, I feel the world of soil offers an opportunity to start from the ground up to collectively imagine and shape new narratives when thinking about the societal challenges that we face due to uh, the climate crisis. So this for me has been a, a really new and unknown space. Um, constant exploration, lots of experimentation. Um, some of the questions that have come up is what is, what even is soil? Why is it important to us as humans? And what do we think and feel about the soil? Um, and what can we learn from it? 
So I began to explore ways in which we can think about our future relationship with soil. Um, in the Western world, uh, I think the ways in which we talk about climate change is often quite meaningless for a lot of people. There is a, a sort of disconnect. We often sort of put the outcome before the value. Um, for example, when we're talking about reversing climate change, we focus on the outcome um, and try to find technical solutions, um, which often then become privately owned and follow the same sort of capitalistic trajectory. What we don't do is focus on the reason why we're doing it, the value, the purpose, which is so that people now and in generations to come can have a better life that's more in tune with nature. Um, so for me, this is where one of the disconnecting factors to climate change is. Um, and for me, the, the, the work needs to focus on finding uh, local commonality with the people who live around you based on individual needs and realities, rather than sort of becoming overwhelmed by all of the global issues that are immense. And I have done that a lot. Um, so I started a project um, called Unearthed as the sort of more I researched soil, the more I understood that it's not just a challenge for agriculture, construction, or the food industry. Soil, it needs a collective voice from, from all of us. And the ideas surrounding uh, soil futures sort of starts from our collective locality. Where are the opportunities to interact with soil? What is already in place? And what are the barriers stopping people from having an opportunity? who is doing the work and what reparations are needed. I'm really interested in regenerative narratives that promote and support collective well-being, celebrate difference, they break cycles and they focus on holistic approaches to environmental uh, action. So as a process, I hope this exploration of soil and the interrelated narrative constantly evolve um, and is driven by care and oneness uh, much like that of the mycelium network, which is the underground network of a mushroom. So through this work, I sort of aim to break down complicated explanations of soil science, hopefully give an accessible uh, perspective uh, so that the challenges we face can be better understood, relatable on a, on a personal level uh, and engaged with on an open and playful level. So. To start with, I'd like to ask a question, if you could pop it in the chat. Um, what words would you associate with soil? What, there's no right or wrong here. It's just what you think. So this quote here from um, Katsuyuki Minami, um, really kind of, I read this quite a while back and it really got me thinking about our development, our cultural development, our evolution um, and where it came from. And culture originally meant cultivating the soil and raising crops. Over time, the concept became more abstract and began, began to include both the physical, intellectual and spiritual products derived from altering nature. Therefore, culture not only includes food, clothing and shelter, but also technology, academia, art, morality, religion, politics, and other livelihood shaping modes. So I wanted, I started off by looking at a lot of science basically, um, and what even is soil and why is it important? Well, soil is an incredibly complex and ever-changing environment made up of minerals from the rocks below, or nearby uh, organic matter from the remains of plants and other living uh, beings, um, and the non sort of human beings that live within the soil that form vast, interconnected, intelligent, and interwoven ecosystems. The changing weathers and seasons due to climate change are having huge impacts on how soil ecosystems behave. Too hot or too cold, the life slows down, too wet, and the soil lacks oxygen too dry and the soil becomes compacted and hard and, and loses its ability to drain properly and can result in erosion. Healthy soil is a collaborative process, leaves falling from a tree to the ground below, worms rising to the surface during rainfall, uh, bacteria fighting off threats to its surroundings, uh, fungi turning broken branches into nutrients for its connected networks. 
all of these systems, all of these things play an important part and an important role in, in sustaining balance, allowing growth, healing, fertility and wealth in the underground world. For me, soil without biology is, is dirt. Um, and that's what a lot of us uh, think about is, you know, our, our relationship to, to soil in this country is, is, is dirt. Um, so not only does soil provide 98% of our foods, the ground we walk on actually regulates the, the temperature and the air quality of the planet. It filters our water and stores carbon. Um, and this is because it's a living network of insects, roots, fungus, bacteria, and algae that work together and form a number of symbiotic relationships with, with plants and trees. Um, so beneath our feet is a vast communication network, much like our internet, um, with its own independent in intelligence that we're really yet to observe and understand. Um, so from speaking with many soil scientists and environmental experts, both here in the UK and in Austria and in Canada, the more I learn how hard it is to understand what is actually going on below our feet. Uh, visually, it's almost impossible to get a clear picture of soil uh, and its health without extensive lab testing and analysis, which then it forms a sort of an interpretation of that soil at that moment in time in that specific location. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Uh, Susan Simard, um, who is a forest ecologist, and around two decades ago discovered that uh, trees communicate their needs and send other nutrients via uh, the fungal network, basically. Um, and in other words, they, she found that they talk to each other, they exchange nutrients, they, um, they provide care packages to their sick, they know who their kin are, and they have the ability to hold memory and learn albeit in a very different way to, to how we do it. So the symbiotic relationship between trees and fungi is fascinating um, and inspired a lot of my early thinking this year. We often think of trees as the lungs of the world. Well, they wouldn't be here without the healthy soil. Um, and according to Columbia University's Earth Institute, soils remove about 25% of the world's fossil fuels uh, emissions each year. Trees need nutrients, and um, but they can't, they can't break them down. And fungi need sugars that the tree generates through photosynthesis. They sort of figure out an exchange rate, and they make the transaction for the good of the soil. Underground uh, carbon is the currency. There are, there are lots of other factors as part of the relationship, such as protection against threats, uh, providing structure to the soil, which sustains the environment and sequestering carbon and, and storing water. So this is all quite heavy and, and science based. And I find myself going down a wormhole of facts and figures, which really inspiring, super interesting, became really overwhelming and, and stumped my creative thinking. The, my artistic practice has always been about creating platforms for authentic storytelling and community engagement. So thinking how on earth do I make conversations about soil science, soil science emotive and accessible? Um, so first of all, all of the things I've talked about happen in our local area. If you have a garden or a green space nearby, or even a plant in your window, these interactions are going on all around us. Um, and we are part of that. Um, another thing, yeah, um, we are part of that. And, you know, just like us, the, the underground world needs water, it needs food, it needs protection, communication, space and air. Um, so I wanted to, to try and better understand this world and, and understand this world on its terms as well and, and find out what it might teach us about our above ground systems. So as a species, we are deemed to exhibit highly intelligent behaviour, which has got us to the stage of dominance uh, on a planetary scale. But for me, I really battle with this measure of intelligence when we're rapidly destroying the planetary boundaries that allow us to grow uh, and with nature, um, driven by capitalism. In, and, and kind of focusing on us, uh, we feel trapped in this and it leads to a, a kind of dystopian paral paralysis where the sort of motivations of us, the individuals are impeded to engage and we're left seeking hope. So 
I turn to soil ecosystems to see what we might learn from other forms of intelligence, which are less unknown, but may offer alternatives to our linear destructive path. The subterranean world offers an endless treasure trove of possibilities for the co-creation of narrative, which encourages imagination, emotion and connection. The environmental challenges that we face are really difficult to address with traditional top-down processes, and it needs everyone with their individual realities at the table equally uh, to understand really how we feel as a valid form of research, soil included in that. In order to be able to tackle the interconnected challenges, it's essential to start with uh, human knowledge, which not only provides our sort of most intellectual research, um, it also, but our, our ancestral knowledge, our sensory perceptions and our emotional responses. For me, in order to work with nature, we need to try and understand the language of nature on its terms. Um, so, I want to introduce you to a few different organisms below ground now. This is uh, Fusarium polycephorum, which is a, a slime mold. Um, and slime molds are brainless organisms with no nervous system, 702 different sexes that are capable of solving complex problems and working to restore balance within the soil ecosystem. It's made up of thousands of individual cells that move together with their vascular-like growths that connect to its food sources. But when two or more slime molds meet um, and they like each other, they dissolve the cell membranes that separate each individual cell and fuse together in one membrane. Um, and there's no, so that's, yeah, so that means that there's no um, limit to the number of individuals that can join the collective. Um, it means two individuals with individual genetics can exist within the same body. Um, and each, each cell is, is making decisions that ultimately benefit the whole collective. There is a real oneness there. Um, another thing as well is, is bacteria, the, the health and um, functionality and biodiversity of our soils cannot be easily centrally experienced by humans, but we can relate to it in, in lots of different ways. And bacteria is the smallest in scale, but the largest in numbers. Um, it also uses another ecosystem as a host, us. We, in our physical form, we, we're an ecosystem full of cells and processes, functions and boundaries that need the nutrients from food, which grow from the nutrients in the ground. Um, we're actually made up of more bacteria from the soil than our own human cells. Um, and the bacteria in our gut that protects us from diseases comes from the food we eat, food that we eat, uh, which comes from the soil that we grow. So. We're always told to look after our gut. Um, some people suggesting it's our second brain and, and has a lot to do with our behaviors. Um, so um, I started off with a question. What can we learn from observing a world we can't see um, and know little about, but is so important to our lives? I was really fortunate last year to get an allotment. Um, and I started trying the no dig technique as I learned that covering the overgrown land with cardboard and putting soil on top actually didn't disturb the already existing network underground of fungi and roots that were working away. Um, I wanted to feed the soil. Um, so this got me thinking, how on earth do you observe soil? Like what kit would you use? What are you, what am I trying to observe? And really sort of had to question my intentions. I didn't want to just extract from Earth like we, what we normally do. Um, and also, was this me just trying to communicate with the soil inhabitants, which I don't think I'd be able to do in, in my lifetime. Um, so I came across a thing called Plant Wave, which uh, I think it used to be called Midi Sprite, where it's a kind of novel way of putting two electrodes on leaves. Um, and then it uses, uh, it detects the slight variations um, and then and presents music, basically. So you can listen to the music, musical rhythms of your plant, basically. Um, but I wanted to explore a sort of a more natural way to observe soil uh, on its terms. So I didn't really want to sort of disturb the soil I was trying to observe. Um, and during the pandemic at the allotment, I was really grateful for the opportunity to just be with soil, to sit 
and be present um, and imagine what might be going on underground. Um, to think about how I impact the soil as well and, and what it does for me. Um, I was also questioning why I was lucky enough to get a space to grow food when others don't even have a garden. I, I waited sort of 18 months to get an allotment. And then when I got it, there was actually still 168 people on the waiting list. Um, and as of right now, there's over 9,000 people on the waiting list in Bristol. And I think there's only four, just over 4,000 um, plots in total. So there's a real need there for people and a real want from people to, to be able to grow. Um, I was kindly sent some kit by, um, lent some kit by Duncan and Speakman um, to start recording soil signs and sort of got some hydrophones and geophones uh, and a Zoom recorder. And the act of sticking a microphone in the ground was really interesting. Um, there were lots of really unusual noises. Um, it could have been human made, such as the rumble from the M32. Um, noises from birds and creatures in the soil um, and also the weather played a huge part in, in that as well. When it rained, I noticed that the ground became more active, it sort of activated the ground. Um, so it really played with my attention and my perception of soil and uh, thinking about the geology, the kind of otherworldliness um, from lots of sci-fi uh, programmes and, and films thinking about the underground worlds, um, my personal connection and my the time that I'm at that space, um, my intention is extraction as well. Um, so I was picking up some really interesting stuff, really interesting recordings, but because I've never really recorded or analysed sound before, um, I was stepping in really into an unknown world. So I started working with Joseph Horton, um, who's a creative technologist who specializes in interaction and sound. And bless him, I sent some of the recordings to him, uh, not really with loads of context. Um, and there was so much going on in the recordings. Um, it was really difficult to, to, to know what, what on earth they were, basically. Um, so I carried out an audiogram test um, by placing a loudspeaker in the ground. Um, and playing a frequency suite that you can see here, um, something like 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz to see what the microphones were picking up. Um, and we were picking up things like rumbles from uh, electromagnetic waves, so it could be some cables in the ground, could be uh, the motorway from, from um, the M32, the signs, the rumbles. Um, also the, the water in the ground, it could be so many different factors. Um, also made me think like, why, what am I trying to identify and what's the purpose of that? Um, you know, if I do find out what things are making certain noises, will that change my intention? Um, for me, I definitely wanted to hear worms just to kind of get a reassurance I was doing well on the allotment, but you know, that's a really difficult thing to, to try and capture. There is, a lot of communication through uh, vibration underground. A lot of creatures underground don't have eyes. They rely on touch and vibrations to navigate. Worms um, definitely uh, respond well to water. Um, as you know, the, the dances when you, you kind of, um, when water hits the surface, worms tend to come up. So when I put the microphone in the ground, I actually um, watered the ground and you could hear it's really intense. So I can imagine, I can only imagine what that's like for a worm. Um, Bernie Kreiss, uh, who is an incredible composer focusing on above ground soundscape uh, ecology, hypothesized that each creature um, appears to have its own sonic niche, its own channel or space in the frequency spectrum and uh, a slot occupied by no other at that particular moment. And this made me think if we're not sort of separate from nature, then how is nature adapting to the noise we are making above ground? does the soil ecosystem communicate better at night when we're quieter? Um, are they creating new frequencies um, so they can hear themselves? Um, it also made me think when I was listening, I was listening from a human perspective. I've got headphones on and I'm listening from above ground. I kind of wanted people to, for people to be able to feel the activity underground. So I started experimenting with transducers, uh, transducers, which is a device that converts energy from one form to a readable signal. Um, and you can see here at the top right, there's some uh, transducer there. Um, 
So what we tried, started doing is, is trying to figure out how, what sort of things we could put through the transducer and the low rumbling sounds would come through. But this is something we're going to explore a little bit more uh, later on this year, uh, an experience that combines poetry, citizen science um, and soil science um, to, to get a kind of more embodied sound um, and try and think of it, think of soil from a soil perspective. Um, so I have partnered with uh, UE and Somerset Wildlife Trust um, and we've just put in a bid where we're going to experiment with some ultrasound recording kit um, and create a series of public events at Honeygar Farm which is a lowland um, peat uh, level which is on the Somerset levels. Um, we're going to create some events then uh, next year. Um, so seeing soil beyond a commodity, I think in the Western world, we seem to have lost our connection to soil due to sort of the extractive systems that see it as a commodity for, for land ownership, farming and resource. Um, and culturally, culturally, a lot of us see soil as dirt, as neglected, uh, unseen and, and really uninteresting. In the UK, the Environment Agency, um, the government's department for protecting and improving the environment, reported that there's actually insufficient data on, on our soils and investment is needed in soil monitoring. When talking about the, the climate crisis, we often talk about water and air, yet just 0.41% of the cash invested in environmental monitoring goes on examining the soil. When I hear the government say that they need to monitor soils, I all I hear is that it needs to be monetized. Um, and one way they do this is, is natural capital accounting, um, which is kind of assessing all of the assets for the, the kind of envir environmental services and the economic production that it can give. Um, for me, none of this none of this centers biodiversity or, or cultural value. What about the the loss of green spaces that support our mental and physical health, the loss of nutrient rich soils that support our food and provide our bodies with the vital defensive bacteria um, and help us synthesize our medicines to protect us from diseases. If we want to put an economic value on soil, then we need to look at what it supports and factor that in. And it kind of supports all, all life on, on, this, on this land. So yeah, so soil, it currently stores about 10 billion tonnes of carbon, UK soil um, is roughly equal to about 80 years of annual UK greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if understood, harnessed and protected, it has the potential to clean up polluted air from around uh, from the 200 years of destructive industrialization. Um, so how we interact with soil. We interact with soil um, by many different ways, but our main kind of thing that we all need is food and food, um, it, it gives us the space to, to really connect with soil. Um, access to green spaces is largely unequal in the UK. Working class communities and people of colour largely do not have opportunities to, to have a practical relationship with soil close to them. I think there's no doubt that, you know, we've seen it over the last year that, you know, uh, engagement with nature and, and storytelling uh, combined are, are really so important for our mental health uh, and access to affordable nutrient rich foods are essential for our health. Um, so what I've started to do is look at food security, and that is a way that we can start to talk about soil through through food. And in the UK, we, we import about two, five, two thirds of our food and about a third of our food goes to waste. Yet one point seven million people live in food poverty. The pandemic has massively increased this. And, I, you know, in, in Bristol, we've seen so many different people um, needing food banks um, and probably all around the UK as well. Um, so people are struggling to get the valuable nutrient rich foods their body needs um, and for me it's really difficult to understand why this system is broke and how we can kind of rethink about this system. Um, according to a report from the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee, the UK's um, food poverty rate is among the highest in Europe despite being the sixth richest country in the world. Um, so 
I kind of wanted to start looking at nature as uh, as a different way of thinking uh, about our systems. So biomimicry is an approach to innovation which studies models, systems and elements of nature to solve complex human problems. Uh, it's often focused on product design, such as the, the bullet train um, that was actually redesigned from a kingfisher's beak to stop the, the boom it created when it would travel through tunnels. Um, people are now looking at spider webs, um, silk, um, which is inspiring a lot of textiles, um, and the construction industry, which is aiming to become carbon neutral. Bioengineers have now turned to mycelium to create building materials. Um, all of this for me is a, a step in a better direction, but it feels it sort of feeds into the idea that we as humans benefit from nature and we need to keep building and making in the same trajectory. I've become really excited about using biomimicry to better understand our cultural evolution and use it to redesign our systems, our patterns, our flows and cycles to try and form new symbiotic relationships with nature. How might nature provide some insight as to how we might create the frameworks for regenerative conversations or imaginings about our future relationship with soil? If we take the uh, life cycle of a mushroom, um, for example, um, it's a regenerative cycle which needs the right conditions to support its collective in order to thrive. So starting with the spores, uh, I see these as our imaginations. Um, they're all around us already and, and they can change the weather. They breathe spores in, uh, we breathe spores in with every breath we take. They are very much part of us. Um, and they are the starting point of a mushroom life cycle, but they need the conditions to germinate. They need food, they need water, they need air. Um, and once they start to germinate, they become hyphae, which are the uh, thread-like strands of a mycelium network. They then find another hyphae that they have a, a commonality with and then join forces. And this continues to grow into a mycelium network. I see this stage as the, the collective imagination stage where anywhere is possible, supported by the rest of the network, and it goes where the energy goes. It's a constant process. Again, it needs the right conditions to grow with a focus on the whole network, evenly distributing nutrients throughout the whole network in order for it to thrive. Um, and once the conditions have got to a point where they're really thriving, they break through the surface of the soil and they create the mushroom, the collective action. Um, this, this example is one of a number of ideas we're playing around with. Um, the experiments that we've been carrying out sort of now lead into a period of R&D with myself, Rosanna Dias, and three young creatives from Bristol that see us um, co-design and deliver a pilot series, um, well, we've done one of them at Green Man Festival, um, but some collective care um, imagining sessions, thinking about how we might engage with different communities about soil ecologies and the interrelated narratives, such as uh, food justice, land rights, and, and land pollution. Um, so with all this in mind, the next stage, um, we're kind of looking to use science to influence and support policy change using biomimicry to creatively imagine new narratives and creative technology to break down those barriers. Um, I'd just like to ask another question. Uh, the question I asked at the start of what words would you associate with soil? Um, I wondered if you could repeat that question, if, if there's anything that's popped up. Um, but I'd just like to say this if I may to close. I'm, I'm kind of, when engaging with conversations about soil, I hope that you can really sort of think about this ecosystem in a different way, beyond sort of just growing plants and trees, life and death, and land ownership and borders. What might we learn about our human methods of communication and consciousness if we observe the subterranean ecosystems that support all life on Earth? What might this teach us about our natural forms of intelligence that exist outside the human mind? And how might we acquire and exchange local knowledge about our soils and the interrelated narratives and cultivate visions of care which arise from exploring human soil interactions? Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. <laughs> Oh, wow, a little fanfare there for <laughs> it's not right. Uh, a really enriching conversation there about um, the hidden life of soil. And um, one of the questions that comes off the bat straight away for me is 
where do you see this research taking you next? What, 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 what does the kind of, what does the finished thing feel like? I think for me, it's, it's, it's still a process at the moment. Uh, and it's still in that deep listening stage. This is me in my room and I've got a few collaborators, but I think there needs to be more input from, from other people. Um, and, and people's realities are different in different areas of, of the UK, for example. So all of that feeds into kind of how we might overcome some of the challenges that we face in our in our locality. Um, in, in my head, there's, there's many different things that could be uh, an, an artist, uh, uh, artistic installation in certain areas that tours and people feed into that where we kind of allow uh, narrative to flow but also bring in policy makers from um, from those different communities and really get them to be part of that and listen to that and just really deeply listen to that um, that's kind of where I see it going great so deep listening to communities as much as deep listening to the soil mm -hmm. Um, so Vic Tillotson asks, you mentioned that you asked yourself, will the underground sounds I hear change my intention? Mm. Did you find an answer for this? Yeah. So initially I, I did start out wanting to try and identify and create a taxonomy of the science, which is absolutely not what I, you know, that's, it's, it's kind of moved from that. Um, like why, why would I want to do that? And, and for me, it was about trying to find a connection to, to soil and finding a way that 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 might sort of create windows for people to be able to, to listen into soil and know that it is a living, breathing world rather than our relationship that we have right now, which is, you know, it's not it's not the best relationship with soil. So it's about kind of giving inspiration, hopefully, for people to, to start conversations. So a few responses to your soil question. Uh, mm. One person says the first word that came to mind was tasty. Um, another says they associate soil with Mother Earth and nurture. Mm. Um, and another says network. Hopefully that provides some uh, inspiration for the next steps for you. Um, we have another question. Uh, in what ways can we enrich our soil and promote biodiversity when growing food in an allotment or garden? You mentioned no dig growing. Is that one of the best ways to do this on a local level? Um, I think yes that is a that is a really good way um composting so something i've been doing quite a lot is trying to understand about food waste so i mentioned earlier about the, the food waste that we have i think if we if we work in our local um local economies we can think about how we what we do with our waste food we can put that back in we can feed the soil which will then return food for us so i think composting is probably one of the most symbiotic things we can do with soil as humans um, but it also allows for people to be part of that there are quite a few different compost clubs um, which are great spaces for people to kind of bring their food waste and, and get some organic soil uh, at the end of that as well um, but also get involved in that in that process um, and I know that you know there's not huge amounts of access for lots of people within a, within a city for example um, so it's about kind of really amplifying that i know that um grow wilder which is part of the avon somerset trust um they do some really good things with, with soil regeneration um edible bristol uh land in our names are doing some really great stuff as well so there's lots of different networks and, and if anybody wants any more resource i'm happy to share what i've got um so drop me an email I wonder if you could tell people a little bit more about what you know about no dig particularly because it involves um mycorrhizal fungi and kind of speaks to like why you shouldn't interrupt the soil yeah so soil erosion is a really big problem where soil erosion um if you think of a, a farmer's field um when it doesn't have any crops it it basically it turns to dust so when there's an existing network underground of, of um, roots and fungi, it creates a structure. It kind of holds the, the humus of the soil, I think it's, I always say humus, of the, of the soil together. Um, and also it stores water and all of these things. So if we start digging and tilling up, it, it breaks that ability, it breaks its strength really to be able to do that. And to it, it, then also when we, when we dig the soil, it then uh, allows the carbon that's below um, to then oxidise and go back into the air. So no dig is a really good technique um, to, to try and uh, 
kind of keep soil as it should be in a way. I know you're putting cardboard on it, but it kind of suppresses the weeds. I think that's why we dig is to get rid of the weeds, but carbon kind of suppress, uh, the cardboard suppresses that. And then you can kind of put uh, soil on top, compost on top, and then the worms will come up and take that down. Great, thanks. Anybody who wants to learn more about no, uh, no dig should check out Charles Dowding. Yes. Be the kind of uh, the lord of uh, no dig uh, gardening. Um, there's another question, uh, and by the way, if anyone else has any questions, we do have time for a few more. So please ping them in the chat or tweet us at PMT UK, and we will pick them up. Um, uh, Joe Lansdowne says, as the previous tenant of your of your allotment, I'm wondering whether the things that I did there, not as sensitively of you as you, affected what you heard. <laughs> well. Um, the lot room was in really good shape, uh, by the way. Um, uh, there are um, lovely um, Jerusalem artichokes that keep coming through, so I, 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 you can definitely come and take some of them. Um, but I don't, I don't think so. I think the soil was in a really healthy condition. I, I definitely uh, t I tested the soil just to, for my own benefit to see what it might need, um, and it was all really good. So um, yeah, I, I think. <laughs> I don't really know. I didn't really see it before when you were growing, but the soil is in really good condition. There you go, Joe. I hope you can sleep easier now. You know, <laughs> soil was. And um, Lucas, I think we're going to draw to a close at this point. Uh, there are no more questions. I want to say a massive thank you for taking time to talk to us today um, and deepen everyone's knowledge of, the, of soil. I'm sure we're going to be talking about this more as you continue your research. Yeah. Um, before we let you all go out there, next week's talk is all about the remote control residency, which is run by the company behind Mimu Gloves. Mimu Gloves are a wearable, motion-based musical instrument and controller, and we'll be hearing from the artists on that who have been a part of that residency and about their experience of working with the gloves and how the projects they're working on are developing. And a quick shout out this weekend, award-winning composer and PM Studio resident Duncan Speakman is inviting you to experience only expansion. It's a one-of-a-kind augmented audio walk through Bristol, walk that beautifully combines the sound of your surroundings with recordings of environments from across the globe. And it's running from the workshop in Studio 5, which is just downstairs on Saturday and Sunday between 2 and 7 p.m. Bookings are possible on the watershed, but if it says sold out, do come down and check it out anyway, because there are lots of opportunities to do uh, to walk up and take part in the experience. And at the same time, you get to experience the excellent work of Katie, Con uh, Katie Connor and Kathy Hind uh, with some film and installation work, which includes some very cool hydroponics and um, that are worth checking by checking out just on their own. You can get news on all events associated with the studio and all our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio. Follow us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram or by subscribing to the newsletter on our website. And don't forget, while you're sat there listening to me close out this talk, hit subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit thumbs up. So the more likes we get, the more subscribers we get, the more we can share stories like this and let you know when our latest content is out. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you all again here, same time, same place, next week.